Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. And once again, I'm joined by Paul Lamb for the Match Worn Celtic Jersey podcast. Welcome back, Paul. Hi, Paul. Good to be back. It's always a pleasure. We've got uh, another four jerseys to discuss from your collection two home jerseys and two away, as we normally do, spanning the era 1987 right up to 2016. 1987, it's a, a memorable season, Paul, the centenary season. It was a vintage season for the jerseys as well. We're going to talk again about the home shirt. Talk to us about the centenary shirt and the significance of the one that we have on today. Obviously, the centenary shirts featured before on the, the podcast. It's a, another cracking home one from a, a one-off game. This one is black embroidery below the centenary crest on this shirt. It was from David Province testimonial. Yes, this centenary jersey was worn in two Celtic testimonials uh, between 1987 and 1989 when it was worn. It was worn in the Tommy Burns testimonial and also in the David Proven testimonial, as you mentioned there. Both matches played in 1987 and memorable for many different reasons. First of all, it was a testimonial due to the fact that Davy had to retire through illness, which, I mean, he was a popular winger for Celtic over a number of seasons. Not as popular these days, Paul. No, he's not a popular pundit. And he was uh, name-checked in the John Barnes podcast last week, wasn't he, as being one of the uh, the guys who was uh, feeding off information from the dressing room and leaking it out into the press, into the world of the Scottish media, which was an interesting one. When I think back, Paul, I was aware that there was a so-called mole at Celtic. You know, there was too many stories uh, coming out in the press. I don't know if that had been confirmed until that interview. Had it always been rumour up until then? As far as I was aware, uh, mm-hmm. I'd never heard anything concrete. It's always the, the way, I mean, people can put two and two together. And uh, they realised around about that time, too much information was coming out at Celtic Park and people wondered who was involved and John Barnes clarified that last week. The man he mentioned, David Proven, being the reporter at this time, he was a winger who, as I say, was struck down by illness and a testimonial was arranged against a team who was sitting at the top of the English First Division back then, Brian Clough's Nottingham Forest. What I found interesting was I spoke to David Proven about this game and I brought up with him that Neely Mocking and Brian Clough were at Middlesbrough together back in the 1950s. And in actual fact, Brian Clough used to wash Neely's boots. And so obviously they met up again that night for this particular game. There was a, there was another special guest. There's a brilliant image. There's a great picture of David Proven with Kenny Dalgleish both wearing the Celtic centenary jerseys. You'll have seen that image. I mean, you can see the embroidery beautifully in that picture of Dalgleish and Proven uh, hugging each other. It wasn't the last time Dalgleish played for Celtic at Celtic Park. He did appear a few times in kind of benefit matches. He came back for the Mike Galloway game. Yep. What can you tell us about the specifics of this jersey? Once again, no numbers on the back. Do you know who wore it? I've got this shirt along with the Tommy Burns testimonial shirt at the same time. And I was told that both were worn by Peter Grant. Again, no concrete proof to back that up. But again, at the time, that's what I was told. Either way, it's still, both of them are cracking examples of the, the centenary shirt. Player versions, you know, as rare as they are, never mind from testimonial games at that time. Great shirts to have. Absolutely. And when you look at the jersey you've got there, Paul, is it a long or short sleeved shirt that you've got? I think Peter Grant tended to wear short sleeves, didn't he? Yeah, it's just the short sleeve version, yeah. So it's a classic Celtic jersey with five green hoops. So the hoops are quite thick uh, because we always talk about six or seven green hoops, Paul, being the kind of classic design. But there's five hoops there. The commemorative crest, we've spoken about that crest before because I raised the fact that Celtic never trademarked it. And I think I've seen it popping up in merchandise ever since I mentioned that. So (laughs) I don't know if the people producing that merchandise listen to the show. C.R. Smith in bold black going along with the embroidery underneath the crest for the Davy Proven testimonial match just a classic jersey I think did it not uh, did it get into the final of the Celtic pole recently it was it was uh, the centenary shirt against the, the 1965-72 home shirt the, the Lisbon shirt it was the, the two of them and a head to head and again it's one of these ones Paul that there's so many fond memories 
around that jersey. When you look at that centenary jersey, you remember the victory against Hearts in the semi-final, the game against Dundee when we won the league 3-0, the Dundee United Cup final in the sunshine. You remember the Scottish Cup final the following year. You don't remember all the poor results the following year because the second season wasn't as good as the first, nowhere near as good as the first. Uh, but the game itself, the Davy Proven testimonial, Celtic won, Nottingham Forest 3. Our goal was scored by Mick McCarthy and a couple of the Forest goals were scored by Brian Clough son Nigel Nigel Clough I, I do remember I went down to Anfield to watch Liverpool play in Nottingham Forest in the early 90s uh, 2-2 Nigel Clough scored the two goals and he was tremendous Brian Clough did have connections up at Celtic Park for many many years he was good friends with Huey Burt who was the Celtic photographer and a close friend of Jimmy McGrory and Jock Steen. so Brian Clough would have been more than welcome up at Celtic Park it was the last time I believe Nottingham Forest played Celtic back in 1987 yeah could be right there. I do vividly remember being at this game. It was uh, the one and only time in the old Celtic Park. I was in the, the old Rangers end for a game. A right good crowd, over 40,000 that night and frozen cold by all accounts. Yeah, for what I remember. The end of November, the game was played at, you know, so they've been coming deep into winter time. It's a great jersey to have, Paul. I mean, the centenary shirt, as we've already discussed, is one of the most popular over the piece. And we know that the template was used by Umbro for a number of different teams and uh, you know Aberdeen springs to mind and I know Rangers also had the same template with the the collar and the shading and, and the material but I don't think any of them done it as well as Celtic no I think it was the shirt along with that season with everything that happened it just evoked so many memories seeing it it's still a much coveted shirt whether it be a replica or the, the, the retro t- remakes after Kieran Tierney was spotted wearing one on holiday you know it's, it suddenly became the shirt to have everyone was after them again it did. Just one last point on Davy Proven, who, when I met him and interviewed him, I had a, a right good discussion with Davy, and you know he spoke so fondly about Celtic in that interview. That was for the, the Neely Mocking book that I was writing. He had a really good relationship with Neely. When I was talking to John Barnes last week, it occurred to me that there are very, very few ex-Celts, if we could maybe talk about players and management stroke coaching staff. There's very few ex-Celts who are not welcome at Celtic Park. And when I was talking to John Barnes, I, I was thinking about how many really there are. And I think Paolo Di Canio, because of his politics, and I would say Morris Johnston's in that bracket because he did the unthinkable with his betrayal. Do you think Brendan Rodgers is in that bracket? I think Brendan's still a sore point for a lot of people. Not so for the, the fact that he left. It's just it's to do with the, the way he done it. You know, to just up and leave at a crucial point in the season, a lot was in the balance. That's what really cuts a lot of people, you know. I think over time, most people will just get by it, you know, but because it's still kind of fresh in the mind, it's part of the, you know, the, the recent treble treble history, you know, it's... It's still going to be in the background until we, we move on to the kind of next phase of the, the club. Yeah, it was one I was considering when we are talking about David Proven because there, there are other names who are involved in the Scottish media or in the media, the mainstream media. David Proven, ex-players, Charlie Nicholas. I've heard Andy Walker being mentioned in that bracket who, when you think about them as players, you think back on them fondly. And it's unfortunate if, if people are not welcome back at Celtic Park. But I don't think the, the John Barnes story did Davy's reputation any any good, did it? No, no, I don't think it did. But of course, we will make efforts to get Craig Burley on to respond to those claims that John Barnes made. That takes us on to the next jersey as well. And it's an away jersey, Paul. One of my favourites, actually, over time. Uh, we've gone from Umbro in the centenary season. We're now talking about a Nike jersey from 2006. Describe this rarely seen, rarely worn jersey to us. Yeah, once again, it's... All too often, it's a, a plain, almost plain white away shirt that very rarely gets used. Mm-hmm. Seem to be the norm for these. The 2006 one, it's predominantly white shirt with a, a green round neck collar. And it's got a green and yellow vertical stripe running down through the badge, the full length of the shirt. At the time, I remember, it's, I'd, I've always been a, a big lover of the just the plain white shirts. But yeah. I was the opposite to you guys. This was probably my least favourite of all the, the white shirts we've had over the, the years. I don't know why, it's just, there's nothing wrong with it, just, it's never ever grabbed me the way the other ones have. I'm wondering if I was a big fan at the time, or if it's one that I've kind of grown 
to to like over the over the period. Uh, this was the second season of our our kit deal with Nike. They'd come in and, and released three kits in in year one. They retained I think the home jersey in year two and they released a new away and this third stroke European jersey that was as I say very rarely worn. When I look at it for some reason I think of Derek Riordan. When I look at this particular jersey, uh, white with a green and yellow band down the left breast. The Carling logo which for a few pre-season games was changed to Coors. I think I've mentioned before, I thought the Coors colour scheme worked quite well on it. But as you say, the the white jerseys do work well. They do work well. If we go back to 68-69, we're playing St Etienne and there's going to be a clash of colours. So Celtic got Umbro to specifically provide them with a jersey, with a new kit for that game. And it was the all-white kit, Paul, with the, the hoops around the collar and the cuffs. Beautiful. Beautiful jersey. And Agnes Johnston actually told me that um, it was Jinky's favourite Celtic jersey because it reminded him of Real Madrid. And he had the fond memories of the Bernabeu, obviously, when Jinky was the man of the match in the 1967 game after the European Cup final, De Stefano's testimonial. And that kit actually reminded him of that night. So he was a big fan of the, the white, the all white kit. And his number seven jersey is now in Neely Mockin's collection. It is. It's so simple, but it's a beautiful, beautiful jersey. And talking about Real Madrid, one interesting wee fact is that when Celtic played in the World Club Championships against Racing Club, the jerseys that Celtic were wearing on the actual Umbro neck logo, it said, as worn by Real Madrid. I was a big fan. And as I say, we did play against uh, teams like DC United in the 2006-2007 pre-season, wearing the Coors Light sponsor, which worked pretty well. And uh, tell us about the actual, the specifics of this jersey that you've got. It's a long sleeve one, I can see. Yeah, this is a, a long sleeve version. It's actually, it's a European spec one. It has uh, the Champions League star ball on the, the right sleeve and on the, the back. It has the European style name set and numbering applied to it mm-hmm. as opposed to the, the traditional SPL numbers. This one, it's the black lettering and black number 44 is for Stephen McManus. You know, McManus, I just think when Tony Mowbray came in, he froze him out and the end of his career was quite regrettable. It was quite regrettable after the service, you know, coming through as a young guy, building up to to become the captain of the club. He had a a partnership with Gary Caldwell. People criticise that partnership because it wasn't that fashionable, perhaps. I don't know. But when you think about it, Tony Mowbray broke that partnership up when McManus was the captain of the club and Caldwell was actually Scotland's player of the year. And it took us a while to get another good partnership in the centre of defence, didn't it? I think it took us probably until Virgil van Dijk teamed up with Denier. Yeah, I think so, eh? You know, and, and we've gone through a lot of centre-halves, so what game then was it prepared for? Which uh, Champions League game, Paul? To be honest, I've no idea, because we never wore this for any games. Clearly, it's been made up as a possibility for a game, but it would only be used if there was a kit clash. And yeah. it appear that, I mean, the, the few games it was worn in, was pre-season games, I think we only wore it in one league game away to Dunfermline. Yeah. So it's been made up for a European game, but it was never used. Again, it's getting a hold of a match-worn version of this shirt is quite tricky. There's, the fact that it was only used in a couple of games, it's hard to get a hold of. I know someone who's got one of the match-worn SPL shirts from the Dunfermline game, but right. he's not willing to part with it. Again, it'll just to have any kind of a player version example of this shirt is definitely worth having, you know. Absolutely. I mean, I've mentioned a few times I do have one match worn jersey in my collection, my collection of one. But um, the more I think about it, Paul, I've actually got two because, you know, I was allowed to keep the jersey that I wore when I played at Celtic Park as well. So I've still got that, but that one's getting framed. I, w- I would never part with that one. We're moving on to another kit supplier. Uh, Nike, I think, was a mixed bag. A lot of their kits were potentially classics, but then there was a, a few others where they kind of missed. They missed the point a wee bit with their design, and we moved from Nike onto New Balance. And I think that when you speak to fans, most fans on the whole were unhappy with the New Balance output. There was a few really memorable jerseys. Don't get me wrong, but uh, there was a few other horror shows which we'll get to uh, as this podcast continues through the years. But the one that we're discussing today was the home kit for the 2015-16 season and this was just on the back of the 
record-breaking deal that we had done with New Balance. How did you think the first home jersey fared, Paul? On the, the whole, looking at it, you know, it harked back to some of the 80s styles with the, the green hoop with the, the pinstripe by either side of it, you know, yeah. it was taking some elements of the historic kits that we've had, the round neck and a, a slight white v-neck at the top of it as well, you know, there was elements from past glories, as you would say, when it comes to kits, to try and kick them off. I don't remember it being anything too spectacular when it was first launched, but it's on the whole, it is, it's it's a decent kit. What you've got there is again, we were speaking about the centenary hoops being quite thick. The, the hoops on this jersey are fairly thick. I mean, you've only got four full green hoops with one extending onto the, the lining at the bottom. And not since the, dare I say, the controversial jersey that we wore from 1993 to 95 did we have so few green hoops on the jersey. But I don't think it was as noticeable on this one because as you said we had the, the thin pinstripes at the top and bottom of the hoops and that did remind us of some of the classics from the 1980s that was reintroduced and I think that was a good move by New Balance again that Magnus sponsor is always going to tarnish a jersey because it's so imposing as well and you know one of my pet hates where it's sprawled over a number of hoops that's that's what happened but Looking back on the jersey, it is. It's a decent enough home jersey with a collar with a very small V insert, which was a very 1970s style, but this is a round neck as well. And you look at that and you're thinking of players such as Lee Griffiths, for example. Gary Mackay Stephen, I think, modelled this on the Celtic view at the time that it was introduced as well. And on the inside neck, it used the quote, a club like no other, which had become something of an official club motto in recent years. So, yeah, overall, I think it was a success for New Balance coming in at the beginning of their Celtic deal. And again, were you well, you will be able to tell us who wore this jersey because all the details will be on the back. Whose jersey was this one? Getting a hold of an actual Max Horn one of this was this style was quite tricky the early New Balance kits there was no difference between the player shirts and the replicas you would buy in the shop exact same shirt with the exact same name set on it and the SPL Premiership patches that you can get in the shop as well there's a lot of these shirts knocking about that aren't what they say they are so we say I just took the opportunity this one came along from a, a charity aspect and it was Dedrick Bayata's shirt from the game when we played East Kilbride Thistle in the Scottish Cup. Right. He'd swapped shirts at the end of the game and it went to an East Kilbride player who a couple of years later gave it up to a local youth football team for fundraising. Some Someone I worked with as a, a coach at the team and had told me that this was going to be either sold or auctioned to raise funds for the club and it was a, a guaranteed avenue where I could get a genuine match shirt from that time I just took the opportunity and made sure I got it excellent no, that, good on the player good on the player so you've got a Dedrick Boyata jersey there you can the provenance of that is, is second to none that's pretty solid you know and played against East Kilbride remember those days the East Kilbride game if you look at the lineup, just off of the top of my head I'm sure Colin Kazim Richards played that day he did potentially Carlton Cole those were the days Paul those were the days but one significant aspect to this jersey is we did wear it in Ronnie Dyler's final game in charge Motherwell 7-0 last day of the season and that sparked off a 69 game unbeaten domestic run which actually witnessed Celtic go on an invincible treble the following year so this jersey was worn in the first of those 69 games so it's significant in, in that respect as well Paul but it is interesting to note that there was a loophole, if you like, in relation to match-worn jerseys, something that the collectors need to know about. There, there could be a lot of kind of fakes kicking around around that, that era. And that's why it's important that the match-worn or the match-prepared jerseys do have differences. You know, that not because they're thinking of match-worn collectors as such, but it makes the jerseys far more unique, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Uh, in fact, you've got the, the downside of having excess players such that the modern game, these are shipped in by the, the bucket load for the, the club as well so at the end of the season surplus player shirts end up being sold via the, the superstores and online stores and it's also it's another avenue for people to get a hold of the current ones or the, the recent New Balance ones have been known as elite shirts that yeah. you've been able to buy and again they can be badged up as they say you know you can buy these sleeve patches from whatever tournament you want on buy name sets online anywhere and make up a shot and just say that it's a, a certain player from a certain game. Unfortunately, there are people out there that do that, you know, so you really do need to do your research 
when it comes to buying a match worn shirt or a, a, even just a basic player shirt and really trust who you're buying from as well. It's a shame to hear that, Paul. But as you say, it's all about trust as well. And, you know, looking at the provenance of the jersey and if it's changed hands a couple of times, then it's going to get more and more difficult. So delighted to hear that you you have a genuine Boyata shirt. In the same season, the change jersey for me was a brilliant, it was a master stroke by New Balance because they've gone back in time, they've gone back to the 1980s and they've recreated one of the, the probably the fans' favourites from back at that time by giving us a bottle green number with white pinstripes. It was, you know, a very popular jersey back in the day. They've re, and they've recreated it well. This is the thing. We've, we've spoken about a few jerseys that uh, Nike tried to revisit and they've kind of failed. This was a, a right good effort, wasn't it, the away jersey? Yeah, it was. I mean, they scored the hit with this one, New Balance. It's a perfect replication of that 1983 away strip. It's the plain white V-neck collar. The, the perfect shade of green with just the right amount of white pinstripes through it, you know, not to overcrowd it. Spot on, really. Aye, they really did nail it with this particular jersey. I mean, the original, I think... It's famous mainly for the 1982 victory against Ajax in the Olympic Stadium. That's the one that you think of. You, you think of that incredible goal that Charlie Nicholas scored that night against a very strong Ajax side. That game's been mentioned so many times on this podcast. But as you say, you look at the, the recreation of that jersey. They've done it so, so well. But unfortunately, when I look at it, Paul, I think he, Chris Commons throwing the toys at the pram against Mulder in the Europa League. That... I can't help but think about that game because, you know, he was wearing this this shirt at the time. It's got the Foundations logo on the front. And so it's, it's not going to spoil the memory of the jersey for me, but that's what I do remember when I look at that shirt. What about yourself? Yeah, as, as you say, we've mentioned before how a, looking at a shirt can just bring back negative memories as well as positive ones. Yeah. You know, and it's instantly tied to these events. Absolutely. But again, I think universally fans will say, New Balance got it right. It's just a shame they didn't do the white one, Paul, because again, white with the green pinstripes would have looked deadly as well. Yeah, a reversal of this would have been a, an absolute peach to have. It would have been. It really would have. So tell us about this then. I see the foundation logos on it. So was it a European game that this one was uh, prepared or worn in? Yeah, it's uh, a European spec shirt again. At the time when New Balance, at the beginning, the only time there was any difference between a player's shirt and a replica was the European games. Generally, nowadays they've got to have a plain coloured back on them for the, the name and number. Mm-hmm. They stand out for, I'm assuming, TV purposes and for the match officials just to make it easy to see. Yeah. This kind of stuff. So this one has a plain green back on it and it has the the, pin, the white pinstripes show on the, the bottom quarter of the back of the shirt. It has a, the Foundation's logo on it for a European game. It was obviously made up for a game where you weren't allowed to have an alcohol sponsor. Yeah. So this is one of the early incarnations where they, they decided to put the Celtic FC Foundation logo on the, the front of the shirt, which has been a big hit with fans as well to see that done. Myself especially, who's a big supporter of the foundation, you know, so it was great to see that. I believe it was possibly worn, definitely made for the European qualifier, I believe. How do you pronounce it? Sidiamen, fair. Icelandic side. Yeah, because it doesn't have any of the European sleeve patches on it. They don't tend to appear in the early rounds of the, the qualifiers. It's the European spec numbering on the back of it. and. It, yeah. Letterings for Charlie Mulgrew, it's a number 21, and it's nearly in kind of the bottom of the numbers. You used to have maybe the manufacturer's logo mm-hmm. would appear on, on this one, the bottom of each number, and you've got a small Celtic crest featuring on it. Nice touch. Nice few touch, yeah. It is, aye. It's a good detail. A- another collection of four jerseys from the bigger and wider collection that you have, Paul, and it's been an absolute pleasure again to, to talk our way through two homes and two aways. We've spoken about David Proven, Colin Kazim Richards, Derek Riordan and Charlie Mulgrew. I mean, where else do you get that? So tell us if we want to look at the rest of your collection, where do we find you online, Paul? Uh, yeah, all, the, all these shirts can be viewed at www.myceltichirts.co.uk. It's a great 
website to check out, but make sure you've got a couple of hours to do so because you will find yourself down a rabbit hole of match worn Celtic jerseys, Paul. The only other thing left for me to say is thank you once again for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. Pleasure as always, Paul. Cheers.